I tell you, there is no revival that is not birthed in the place of prayer. There is no move of the Holy Spirit that is not birthed by men and women on their knees. And uh, there are many prayer movements that are spoken of, but of the Wesleyans, of the Methodists in the early days, there was a young man who, was, who ended up being John Wesley's chosen successor. His name was, uh, I can't remember his name. Oh, his name was Jean de la Fleche. He was Swiss. And when he came to England, because we don't like the French, he called his name John Fletcher. And um, <laughs> I have no idea why he did it. You know, probably the British could not pronounce French in those days. There was probably some animosity. Anyway, John Fletcher came as a tutor for uh, some uh, member of the aristocracy. And, uh, you know, he was invited in for these beautiful meals, these lavish banquets. And he would end up spending all his days praying and fasting out in the garden. And he was invited into these banquets and these lavish meals. And the governess, who, uh, whose child he was instructing, said to John Fletcher, Why don't you come in? He said, I'd rather be out eating raisins and slices of bread and praying to my God. He said, and the governor said, You need to join those people, the Methodists. And he said, Why? He said, They're just like you, always praying. The Methodists were known as a people of prayer. And I believe the revival that swept through the UK or swept through at least England and Wales because John Wesley never felt he needed to go to Scotland because there was always revival going on in Scotland back in those days. And so the revival that touched England and Wales and even America in the days of John Wesley was a revival that was birthed in prayer. And it was a revival that transformed this nation. I believe the impact of that revival lasted until World War II. I truly believe that the blessings that the Lord released in the victories of war that even were celebrated this past week, 70 years since D-Day, were a direct result of a foundation that was laid in the 1800s because of men and women who prayed for revival in this city. A spiritual revival that led to a moral reformation and national transformation of the, of the morality of this nation that was based no longer on, 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 on personal um, immorality, basically. That was how they were in the beginning of the 17th century. It was raw capitalism and gross immorality and debauchery filled this city and in a generation that was changed in large part due to what happened in that Methodist revival that was led by men like John Whit George Whitfield and John Wesley and his brother Charles and a number of others. A few years ago I had the privilege of going back to the city as a preacher this time and not as a lawyer. And we held a meeting in, in the city temple, which is just down from St. Paul's Cathedral. And I just felt the awe and the fear of the Lord as we held that meeting and the Holy Spirit began to move. And I remembered that about two streets down on uh, Fetter Lane in 1739, New Year's Eve 1739, the Holy Spirit was poured out on a group of young men who were gathering earnestly in prayer on New Year's Eve, 1739. And they got baptized with the Holy Spirit. It became known as the Methodist Pentecost. And out of that outpouring of the Holy Spirit, this nation experienced a revival that led in due course to the ending of the slave trade. William Wilberforce was a young man who was converted as a direct result of the Methodist revival. It touched, I believe that spirit of revival ended up touching men like Lord Shaftesbury who ended up seeing laws passed in Parliament that transformed the working conditions for children, transformed the condition of those who went down the mines and prisoners and those who were condemned as madmen in lunatic asylums and all manner of social transformation flowed as a result of the preaching of the gospel. In this area of London, again, a direct result of that Methodist revival, William Booth, who began the Salvation Army not in order to have soup kitchens or to clothe the poor, but in order that the gospel might go forth with power. And he said, but how are they going to hear the gospel if their stomachs are hungry? And so this city is bathed in revival 
history. This city is a testimony of the fact that God does not leave nations and cities in darkness forever. That our God is the God who makes all things new. And as I drove into the East End, I was like, help God. Help God. As I saw the, just the influence of Islam and the influence of secularism and just saw the adverts as I arrived in the country of, you know, for the World Cup, of which, you know, I'm hoping to be done by 11 o'clock tomorrow night, so don't worry. And um, we will know if revival breaks out because no one will care. But you know where you see a poster and it says, you know, with humor, world sup. And a, an adver advertisement for alcohol. And you go, uh, you know, and, and, and the place in the supermarkets where you see the English flag draped or all across the alcohol aisles. And you think about the debauchery and the immorality and the influence of Islam and the sheer darkness that is covering our city and our nation and the question rises in me is it too late for London is it too late for England and I believe the answer is no I believe the answer is no but I believe it hangs in the balance of what our response is as God's people I don't believe we can take it as a foregone conclusion that God will push back the wave of darkness. Because I tell you this, there are thousands upon thousands of men and women praying in London even today. More fervently than Christians. I want to tell you that. There are people who do not have an intimate connection with the God who created them and they are praying and ministering more fervently to their God than we are to our God who we know and who redeemed us out of darkness into light. And I tell you what, the power, the power that will rule this nation will be the power that is released through prayer. And it will either be the prayers of those who agree with demons or the prayers who, of those who agree with God. There is a battle in this hour over the agreement of men's hearts with the Satan or with God. And to the extent to which God's people become a people who offer up worship who offer up prayer to the King of Kings is the extent to which we will see darkness pushed back in this nation. It really is. Beloved, God can do it without us, but He chooses not to do it without us. We cannot do His part. We cannot pour out His Spirit. Only He can do that. But He says, Though I long to be gracious to you, Isaiah 30, the Lord longs to be gracious to you, it says, he will be gracious to you at the sound of your voice. He's saying, how much do you want me to move? Tell me that you want me to move and I will move. I want to operate in partnership with my people. I created you for intimacy with me because I want you to ask me to do things. Because beloved, at the very core of who we are, we were created to be a praying and a worshiping people. We were created for the dignity of relationship with God, a relationship that is expressed through communication, and that communication is called prayer and worship. Anyway, I have hope for London. Kairos hour for this nation. I don't know if you know, this is a hundred years well, of course, you know this part. This year is 100 years since World War I began. I believe, this is my personal conviction, I can't prove it, I believe World War I was an attempt by the enemy to stop a move of the Spirit that would fill all of Europe. I believe that. I truly believe that. You know, in, how many of you have heard of the Azusa Street Revival? Okay, the Azusa Street Revival in Los Angeles began in 1906. There was 
a spirit of revival that basically was moving, the Lord was hovering and moving across the nations in the early 1900s. And uh, in 1904, there was a great revival in Wales. And in Wales, they prayed for an outpouring of the Spirit in California. A man by the name of Frank Bartleman was an intercessor in California. And he, along with some others, were praying for a move of the Holy Spirit in California. And Evan Roberts and some of the other men and women of the Welsh Revival prayed for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in California. In 1906, the Lord moved with power in Azusa Street, California. Moved with unusual power. It was the beginning of what is known now as the Pentecostal movement. You know, in the book of Joel, and it's quoted by Peter in the book of Acts, it says that in the last days I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And upon young men, young women, old men, old women, I'll pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. And I believe what began at Pentecost in an upper room with a group of Jewish young men and young women is going to culminate before the return of Jesus with a global outpouring of the Holy Spirit on all flesh. Every tribe, every tongue, every nation. That's the promise of Scripture. A global outpouring of the Spirit that ushers in the return of Jesus to the earth. And I believe that we're in the early days of that right now. And I believe we've been in the early days of that, particularly since the Azusa Street outpouring. Because since the Azusa Street outpouring, before 1906, there was very little said of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It was, they, they had been largely neglected. They had not been completely absent, but they'd been largely neglected since the early church. And in 1906, the Holy Spirit was poured out and men and women started speaking in tongues. But more than that, the gifts of the Spirit began to be recovered. The 1 Corinthians 12, gifts of the Holy Spirit, prophecy, words of knowledge, gifts of faith, discerning of spirits, speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues. These supernatural working of miracles, healings, began being recovered on a whole new level. And that revival that began in a little building you know you look at this building and you go you come from the outside you go what is this in the east end of London just a little building nondescript building that was where Azusa Street began in a little nondescript building in the center of Los Angeles in a revival that was an interracial revival in a day when there was no um, what's the word Interracial meetings. There, it was complete segregation in those days. A black man, one-eyed black man called William Seymour got baptized with the Holy Spirit and he refused to let the people be divided. It was white and black. In fact, he would not like this. The white guy sitting and the, and the Indian guy sitting, he would make them split up and sit next to one another in the revival. I mean, he really, he said, this is what has to happen. We have to be united. And as a physical demonstration of that, he would divide them up. So this outpouring of the Spirit began, and they saw the power of God fall. You know, I love what Jesus says in, in John chapter 1, verse 51. Nathaniel has been praying under a fig tree. He's been ministering to the Lord in private. No one's watching him under the fig tree. And Philip brings Nathanael to Jesus, and Jesus operating in a word of knowledge, because Jesus operated under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says to Nathanael, I saw you when you were under the fig tree. There is no one without guile like you. He goes, oh my gosh, I've never seen anything like this. And on the basis of a simple word of knowledge, he says, you're the king of Israel. You're the Messiah. You're the one we've been looking for. And Jesus, in my language, goes, easy, tiger. You're way too easily pleased. You think that's impressive? You haven't seen anything yet. You're going to see heaven opened and angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Those ministering spirits... 
The flames of fire that it speaks of, the angels of God ascending and descending and distributing gifts and power to man on behalf of the Father and ministering to the Son of Man. And I believe that's what happened on Pentecost. There was an open heaven in that Acts 2 upper room and it continued for a number of years. And then I believe it was released at different periods through church history, but it was released in Azusa Street in a unique way. So that they literally saw from time to time flames of fire ascending and descending on the building where they were gathering. So that they called the fire department because they thought the building was on fire. How many of you would like the fire brigade to be called out because there was fire ascending and descending? And they said that when, that, when it was that intense... There was literally a cloud of the glory of God so thick in the room that often the children in the room would play hide and seek in the glory of God. I mean, can you imagine the visible, weighty, thick glory of God descending like a cloud just like it did in the Old Testament and they called it the Shekinah glory. The Shekinah glory. Now the Shekinah is not a, a word that is mentioned in Scripture per se, but it was, the, it was the term that the Jews used to describe where God rested over the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. That was the Shekinah manifest presence of God. And they just didn't know what else to call it, so they called it the Shekinah glory. There's the general command for all believers to pray for the sick. Some people say, well, I don't have any gifts of healing, so I shouldn't pray for the sick. Jesus said, these signs will follow those who believe in my name. They will lay their hand on the sick, and the sick shall recover. So we, none of us have an excuse. You don't have the gifting, you've got the command to pray. But my favorite of all is when healing just happens. When the manifest glory of God is in a room and God spontaneously begins healing people when you're not even asking for them to be healed. I remember when we, we experienced a little bit of this. Rakesh talked about the student awakening. We had a move of the Holy Spirit. It was actually about a year in, in, our, in our Bible school. And we had nightly meetings, almost nightly meetings for about a year. And the presence of the Lord was just there. And we, I, I remember the first healing that happened. We weren't even praying for healing. We were just agreeing with what the Lord wanted to do. I mean, that's what you do when the manifest presence of God is there, doing stuff. You just let God move, and then you interview people to find out what He's been doing, because He's doing so much stuff. I remember interviewing this young lady. She was one of our students, and the Lord had done a whole load of emotional stuff on the inside of her, and we said... You know, so what, what, what's the Lord done? And she began sharing. She said, oh, also, she says, he gave me 2020 vision. So what do you mean he gave you 2020 vision? She said, yeah, well, they were praying for me. And all of a sudden, I couldn't see through my glasses. And I took them off and I had 2020 vision. I mean, come on. That's easy. That's easy. It happened night after night after night where we're in the presence of God and you lay hands on people and it's not by your gift and it's not, you know, you're, you're just agreeing with God. You lay your hands on the sick and they'll be healed and the very thick presence of God was there and the sick got healed. That was what happened on an extravagant scale in Azusa Street. In Azusa Street, there were gifts of healings to be sure, there were those who were being faithful to lay their hands on the sick, but there was something called the Shekinah glory of God. When the presence of God moves into a room, wrong things get made right. When the presence of God moves into a region, wrong things begin to be made right. When the presence of God moves into a nation, the lost get saved, the sick get healed, the laws get changed, because the presence of God is there fighting for the agenda of God in that place. And we got so addicted to the presence of God over that 10-month period. I mean, we saw 
We, I mean, we, we, we recorded, written down testimonies, about 8,000 testimonies of healing. When we get the Shekinah glory, things change. When the presence of God, when heaven opens over our churches and over our families and over our cities and God comes not just to visit but to live for a season, even for a visitation. But the Lord wants more than a visitation. He wants a habitation. He doesn't want just to come to visit. The ultimate goal of God is not just to drop in for a visit for three months. His ultimate goal is to come and live on the earth with man. The, one of the final promises of Scripture is in Revelation 21 verse 3, where the, it says, Behold. Now listen to this carefully. Revelation 21 verse 3 does not say what most of us have grown up to believe. Behold, the dwelling of man is with God. It says, Behold, the dwelling of God shall be with men. God's ultimate address is earth, not heaven. And your ultimate address is earth, not heaven. You see, we are living in days when heaven is separated from the earth. When God created the heavens and the earth, He did not create them with a sense of separation. He created them joined together. And through Christ, God's goal is to bring everything together that is in heaven and that is on earth. It is to remove the barrier once and for all between the heavenly dwelling place of God and the earthly dwelling place of man. That's why Jesus told us to pray, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There is coming a day when as it is in heaven where there's no sickness, no disease, no sorrow, no pain, no suffering, it will be on the earth as well. It is coming. That day is coming. God is going to take up residence on the earth forever. He is going to dwell with us forever and all things are going to be made new. And when God drops in for a visit and when God heals the sick and when God brings a season of restoration or transformation, He's saying, I'm still committed to the plan. I am the God who makes all things new. I am the God who makes all things new. Revelation 21 verse 5. I am the God who makes all things new. It's not what He does, it's who He is. He makes things new. He makes wrong things right. And I believe we are due for a visitation right now. I believe we are due for the Lord to move and awaken the church in a fresh way again. You see, there was another place that was touched in the same way that Azusa Street was touched. Not quite as strong, but in the annals of Pentecostal history. It says that there was one other place on the earth that was touched in a powerful way like Azusa Street. Do you know what country it was in? It was in England. It was in England. In fact, it was in Sunderland, England. That the Holy Spirit moved in 1907 in a powerful way in a church, in an Anglican church. Bless the Anglicans. I've been part of an Anglican church, as you know. But bless the Anglicans. It was in an Anglican church where they'd been praying for revival. And the Lord had begun moving in America. And from America, it had gone to Norway and a man, an English preacher in Norway called Thomas Barrett was invited by this English vicar called Alexander Body to come and minister at his church up in Sunderland. And he came and ministered and in those days they said that in England there were probably less than 500 Pentecostals in the whole of England. Maybe 50 that they knew of in those days. And the Lord came with such power in Sunderland in 1907 that they decided they would have an annual convention there of the Pentecostal leadership of all of Europe. 
And they had a gathering, it was known as the Sunderland Convention, and they decided to hold it over Pentecost week every year. From 1908 they did it until 1914. And there were many men who were part of that. There was a man, you know him, George Jeffries. George Jeffries who started the Elam Pentecostal movement and Kensington Temple and his brother Stephen who held powerful healing and revival crusades. One of the ones that actually was in Sunderland, they started with 400 people on the first night and by the end of the month they were having 3,000 people morning and evening and they had to bring in the mounted police to control the crowds because the Lord was moving so powerfully in that place. In the vestry of Alexander Body, this Anglican minister who was on fire and filled with the Holy Spirit, a young plumber from Bradford came seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit. His name was Smith Wigglesworth. He got filled with the Holy Spirit in that move of God. And they kept these conventions going with fire. They grew and they grew and they grew. And all of these great saints would gather together. Leaders from Britain and Holland and Switzerland and Germany would all gather in Sunderland. And do you know where they would have the overflow meetings? In London. There were people in London who couldn't go that far up north or they were too scared or something. <laughs> or it was too cold. And so, no, they, had, they literally, they said they had overflow meetings in London during that season. Because the Lord was moving. It started in Sunderland, but it moved in that season and filled the whole of the United Kingdom with the fire of the Holy Spirit. There was this season where the Pentecostal fervor, not, by, not, not talking about a denomination's growth, but Pentecostal as in the sense of the Spirit was being poured out all over these islands in a unique way with healing, signs and wonders, the preaching of the gospel. Now, the interesting thing is these Sunderland conventions were led, the primary two leaders were Alexander Body, the English vicar, and a man called Pastor Jonathan Paul, who was a pastor from Berlin, Germany. He was a pastor from Berlin, Germany. In 1910, the Germans in Berlin made a declaration. They gathered together and they made a declaration. The Pentecostal movement is of the devil. They came together in unity and declared the Pentecostal movement as a non-spiritual, non-biblical movement that was not even of God. It was of the devil. That was strike one of the enemy, I believe, to hinder the move of the Holy Spirit that was supposed to catch all of Europe on fire with the gospel and with the power of the Holy Spirit. This man, Jonathan Paul, I talked to a pastor. He's the pastor of the largest church in Germany. I was talking with him last month. And he said, that man, Jonathan Paul, he said, uh, and, and he said this, actually, his church is the largest church in Germany today. And he said, the lady who started his church started it after she was prayed for by George Jeffries. And got the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There was a partnership in the gospel between our two nations to see, I believe, all of Europe filled with the fire of the Holy Spirit. This man, Jonathan Paul, after the Berlin Declaration received such persecution, my friend told me. Such persecution. But you know what he did? He kept gathering with the brethren in Sunderland every year for those seven years. From 1908 to 1914. 1910, the Berlin Declaration did not put out the fire. So you know what I believe the enemy did? The enemy started a war. I don't know if any of you saw, there was a program on the BBC a few weeks ago. Jeremy Paxman was narrating it. And I wasn't aware of this, but in World War I, there was actually a, 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 an attack from the sea against the main land of Great Britain. In the very early years of the war, the Germans sent boats and they attacked the coastline of Great Britain. Do you know where they, where they struck? Hartlepool, the northeast coast of Great Britain. And as I saw that, and I thought about this, I thought, I know what that war was about. That war, 
that drove apart these brothers in the gospel. You see, John Wesley was not a move of the, the Wesleyan movement was a movement that was influenced by a German group of praying people called the Moravians. He connected with these Germans and got on fire for God by the influence of these Germans and then brought the fire to England. And there was this partnership in the gospel between these two nations. And then again, in the Azusa Street days, there was a partnership of the gospel. And this year is the 100 year anniversary. This June is the 100 year anniversary since not only the start of World War I, but since the final one of those Sunderland conventions took place. William Booth, when he came on the scene, he wrote a book, In Darkest England, The Way Out. And in that book, he compared England to darkest Africa. That was how dark England of the 1700s and early 1800s was. You might have gone and been born, if you were transplanted from here to there, you might have looked and go, is there any hope for England? Is there any hope for London? John Wesley could have said, is there any hope for my nation? But he said, I believe in the power of the gospel for salvation. William Booth said, I believe in the power of the gospel unto salvation. And through these men, not laying hold of a new program, but laying hold of a God who is bigger than the gods of this world, they saw the nation transformed. They saw in a generation, multitudes swept into the kingdom. They saw social reform, prison reform, labor reform, the abolition of the slave trade, the transformation of society, not by social justice initiatives, but because God got hold of the hearts of men. Because men got hold of the heart of God. The only hope for our nation is that the Holy Spirit would move again in our nation. That God would make this city and this nation his resting place again. You see, there are examples again and again and again in the scripture of seasons where the glory had departed from the people of God. When the nation was called Ichabod, the glory has departed. Do you know what happens when the glory departs? God's enemies prevail. Whenever Israel neglected the presence and the glory of God, God's enemies prevailed. It didn't matter how much they tried to institute social reform without the presence and the glory of God, there was no hope to prevail against their enemies. The only solution for Israel to prevail against their enemies was to honor the presence of God in their midst. You know, I thought I wanted God to come more than God wanted to come. I believe the starting point as we establish prayer and worship is to understand that God wants to be with us more than we want Him to be with us. That's what He's saying here. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. He says, I want to be on the earth. Read through the scriptures, you'll see that. God wants to be on the earth. The whole plan of world redemption and world restoration is God getting closer and closer and closer to humanity. The question is not, will I come? The question is, can you handle it when I come? We're begging God to come and God's going, I want to come. But where's the place you will build for me? I tell you this, God protects us by not drawing closer than he does. 
I believe the reason God does not draw as close as he wants is to protect us because we could not handle the power and the glory of God. We think we could. God does not want to injure us with pride. He does not want to injure us with the pride that would come if he anointed us with the full measure that he wants to give us. If the manifest presence of God showed up at Capstone Church next Sunday, you would think, wow, that would be glorious, wouldn't it? But I tell you what, stuff happens when the glory of God shows up. People are attracted to it. Individuals get anointed. Individuals start promoting themselves. We don't know the measure of pride that is in our hearts. That the glory of God resting upon weak human flesh, it would actually injure us. We think, no, it would be good for us. And God says, you've not made a dwelling place that is strong enough to contain my glory. Where is the place of my rest? And I believe the place of God's rest is the place where he is no longer striving with us. Where there is no resistance in us to his way where there's no resistance in our hearts to his strategies and his plans and his nature. The place of his rest is the place where we are in agreement with him in our hearts, in our minds, in our emotions, where we say we want what you want, God. We say, oh, we want you, bridegroom God, we want you to come. He says, oh, really? You want an exclusive relationship, 100% faithfulness and loyalty to God? You want to actually begin to do that? Because I don't think we do most of the time. We want to run after other lovers every five minutes and be about 98% loyal to Jesus and think, well, that's good enough. But you know what? I've got to get my fix of EastEnders. Where they're talking about divorce and their immoral relationships. And you're watching films that are filled with violence. You say, well, it's entertainment. By watching it, you are aligning yourselves with murder and violence, which are an abomination to God. God says, do you want to agree with me or do you want to agree with you? This marriage covenant, I'm going to be faithful to you 363 days of the year, but give me two days and three days in a leap year where I can go and do my own thing. It's a meaningless covenant, isn't it? God says, where's the place you will build for me? Where's the place of my rest? You want the fullness of the Spirit? Are you prepared to live your life in the pursuit of 100-fold obedience to me? Are you prepared to walk in exclusive relationship, forsaking all others? Forsaking all others. Where's the place you'll build for me? We say, oh God, we want you to come. And God, I picture God with his feet dangling over the throne, over the balcony of heaven going, I want to put my feet on the earth, but I'm afraid if I did right now, it would destroy you. Where is the place you will build for me? But beloved, unless we have a dwelling place for God on the earth, there is no hope for us to prevail against the great enemies that threaten our lives and our nations. There is no hope. In King David's day, King David made it his priority to make a dwelling place for God. Psalm 132. I will give no sleep to my eyes, no slumber to my eyelids until... I find a dwelling place for God. And at the end of Psalm 132, he says this, 
He says, you've chosen Zion as your dwelling place. And when you come to dwell, it's going to be amazing. The poor are going to be fed. You're going to prevail against your enemies. There's going to be peace and joy in the land when you come to dwell. He was so filled, he said, you see, you know what motivated him to actually do the hard work of building a dwelling place? He had a vision. He says, I'm not prepared to live in the generation of Saul. In the generation of Saul, it was Ichabod. The glory had departed and the Philistines were prevailing against Israel. They were winning. We have to acknowledge in this nation today, darkness is winning. We have to be honest about it. We have to stop celebrating the revival stories. No, we need to keep celebrating the revival stories. But we need to understand that even as we celebrate those revival stories, we are still in the season where the Philistines, so to speak, are winning in this nation. Unless we are honest, we will deceive ourselves and we will wake up one day and the evil one will have prevailed in this nation. As the covenant people of God, God gives us tokens of the moving of His Spirit to say, do you want more than this? Not so we can sit on our hands and say, it's awesome God's moving and close our eyes at the vast majority of the nation that is perishing. Will you take those stories and allow them to put a vision in you to see your family transformed? Your, your community transformed, your church transformed, your city transformed, and your nation transformed. But we've got to be honest. The enemy is prevailing. King David was honest when he came to the throne. He had seen many, many victories of God in his life, but the enemy was still prevailing in the nation. The fact that we have experience personal victories and personal touches from God is not to say that God is prevailing in our nation it's to say God wants to prevail in our nation in the way that you have experienced him personally and corporately as a people what if he would release that into the entire nation King David said I'm not prepared to live with God at a distance anymore I'm not prepared to live with a little bit of his blessing. I want it to touch the nation. And so he exercised all of his energy as king for building a dwelling place for God. What did that look like for him? He said, even though I've got enemies to fight against, I've got strategies to build to prevail against the enemies. As king, I'm going to make my priority building a dwelling place for God. I am going to commit to it. I'm going to spend billions of pounds on it. In those days money, he spent literally billions and billions of pounds on establishing a worship center in the heart of Israel to worship night and day. Because he had the revelation that God would dwell where a throne was built for God to dwell. And he understood that the throne of God was built on the praises of his people. You see, we are living in a nation where Satan has his throne right now. Revelation chapter 2. Jesus says to the church in Pergamum, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Do you know where Satan has his throne? Satan has his throne in every place where we agree with the lies of the devil. The thing that gives the devil authority over our lives is where we agree with what he says. The thing that gives Jesus authority over our lives is when we agree with what he says. The thing that released the authority of Satan over man was because Adam chose to agree with what the devil said rather than what God said. And that created a powerful agreement that released the authority of darkness over the whole earth. And we live in a generation where the majority of people are agreeing with the lies of the enemy. God is not good. God is not powerful. Allah is powerful. Muhammad is his prophet. 
Immorality is okay. Homosexual marriage is okay. And it releases authority in the spirit where those lies are agreed with. But God says, my antidote is to build a throne for myself where Satan has his throne. I want to build a dwelling place on the earth where Satan has his throne. And that dwelling place is called agreement with God. We call it praise. We call it worship. And we call it prayer.